the, 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 fl the hump over the mountain was expected. Yeah, I didn't mind that. But the letdown into Chongqing was a hair-raising experience, and I wonder what I was doing there. Should I go back to Africa or say? But I said, if everybody else can do it, you've got courage enough. Uh, and I never realized that in time I'd make more than 100 landings into that uh, little airport. How many flights did you fly across the hub? I wound up at the end of the war with 680 trips across the hub. I would have possibly made more, but at that time I went to pick up an aeroplane back in America. And when I went to get it, the military had got my aeroplane, and I had to wait another uh, almost a month. And so I was overdue by about almost two months getting back to my duty. But that's the way things happen. So I have no complaints. Somebody once said, well, you were civilian and you were mercenary type person. I said, yeah, I said, but I tried to join the Army Air Corps. They wouldn't take me. So I, this was the next best thing. I said, but I have news for you. I said, if they gave me $5 a month and said, that's your job to do, I said, I'd have done it for nothing. I said, because I didn't like our enemy. We were at war, and this is the best way I felt I could help my allies and General Chenault, and that's why I did it. But now if they want to pay me for it or give me medals or nothing, made no difference. I would have, I'm happy to have done it. Do you think that um, the situation in China was the forgotten theater? Uh, not at that time, because our whole world was involved in that operation. I think I can say this, frankly, that uh, though we were civilians, we came under the umbrella of the China-Burma-India Theater of War. Uh, they gave us our supplies that came by boat from Bombay, by train from Bombay and Calcutta up to Debrigar, and all our cargo was military by the CBI, and our gasoline for our airplanes by the CBI and the people that manned the towers in Kunming and Dinjan and Chabwa were military. So overall, military had a, they, they did not control our operation and when we could fly or couldn't fly. That was done privately by our own CNAC personnel. And, uh, but at the same time, whether it was CNAC or anything else, because air, American Airlines came over uh, with a fleet of aeroplanes, four-engine aeroplanes, and uh, started to fly the hump. But uh, they were the same as we were. They were civilian pilots enough to fly. But they only stayed six months, and they didn't like it very much and went home. Uh, but I'll say this also, that the whole thing was teamwork, whether it was CNAC, or 10th Air Force or 14th Air Force, whoever it was, we, uh, ten, we were all a big team, whether it was the Chindits fighting in Burma, Merrill's Marauders, or the Chinese that were fighting there, or whether it was uh, people peeling, peeling potatoes in the kitchen or manning the towers, whatever the whole operation, it was teamwork that made us possible to do the flying on the hump. Do you think that CMAC was given a due credit for, for really keeping um, a free China alive during its darkest hours? Yes, I think, I think CNAC deserves a lot of credit, uh, regardless of what people might think about being civilians or mercenary or anything else. They did a one terrific job of flying those airplanes across the, and our aeroplanes at the beginning were not the greatest aeroplanes ever. The military had first class aeroplanes, the C 47s. Uh, we had C 53s. These were pre war DC 3s. They were converted to cargo and uh, they were 2,000 pounds lighter than the C 47. They didn't have the luxury instrumentation of the C 47. 
They had what they call a direction finder radio thing, a needle that would point. But it wasn't an automatic direction finder like the C-47s had. This had a big antenna outside, loop, and you'd crank that to get this null and the needle to point to the station. And uh, so in bad weather, if you didn't have this antenna in the null position, as we say, it would freeze on you, and then you couldn't turn it. So we'd fly with that in the null position, and nine times out of ten it would freeze. So you'd turn the airplane to get the null. That's how we operated that one. We didn't have any heaters, because they were built for a small, a low altitude. And they got high altitude, the steam heating would blow up. So they took them out. So we'd wrap up in blankets when we'd fly. And the de-icing, anti-icing wasn't the greatest in the world. And two of our planes for a while didn't have the artificial horizon. They had the old-fashioned, what they call needle ball airspeed. But we managed, and uh, those airplanes did a good job. The flooring was uh, plywood, was not metal, but did have cargo doors. It didn't have what they called two-stage blowers, which would give more power to the engine so you could get to a higher altitude. So we devised our own method of getting altitude. 99% of the time, the, the Burmese Valley created big cumulonimbus clouds and we'd go into those clouds, and as one guy said, it'll take you up like an Otis elevator. And that's how we got a lot of our altitudes, and uh, where the currents of air would be would uplift and help us. And there was enough power, but uh, we were grossing at 30,000 pounds, and those airplanes just weren't really made for that. But somehow we coped with it and made it, and quite a few of our airplanes were beginning Ship 53 or 58, etc., uh, did crash, but these were the C 53 aeroplanes. But we got the C 47s. Wow, that was uh, wonderful. Got everything heaters and whatnot. You've flown more than um, 600. Yes. Is there any one particular flight or incident that, you know, or experience that comes to mind that, that, that is very special, unique, or that you remember very vividly? There were numerous ones, but I can tell you of one when I hadn't been checked out long or being checked out, and four of us were coming back from Kunming, and we had all kinds of cargo, tin and various things like this on board. And uh, one guy said, I know it's sort of like a shortcut. <laughs> you don't have to go over 10,000 feet. And I said, it's not going down to Rangoon or somewhere with the Japs. So of course, we were flying over Japanese territory anyway, and all of Burma was Japanese. So he said, if you follow me, I know this route. So he was the Captain Welsh, and the next guy was Captain Sharkey, and then there was Captain Fox in Ship 53, and myself with a, a Canadian guy named Russ Johnson. So we were on our way. And I'm taking pictures. I have from the old camera and I took pictures. It's so interesting, four in formation. And uh, we got past most of the area. We're coming up on the Salween River. I could see haze and problems up ahead, but we rolled along right away. And then I saw Welsh go through this gap, like a V-shaped thing in the mountains. And shocking, but now I looked at Fox and the storm, the snow and ice, terrible, really coming in hard. And I tried to call Fox and tell him to let's get out of here. But uh, what I thought had happened was that the storm was so powerful, the, the, the winds, and you do have winds up there over 100 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour had come over the mountain and like water over a dam. And it, thing, and it started to suck us into the, into the mountains. And that's what got Fox in. And he couldn't get out, I'm sure. And he was a busy boy, I, I can see that. And I decided to go down the mountain. And I saw his left wing hit the trees and he was gone. And I went down to the Salween and 
came up and got home. And then they asked me what happened. And I said, well, I saw a fox hit the mountain. Well, maybe not. And I said, well, maybe. But uh, he never showed up. So I knew he'd, he'd had it. Next day, I'm flying back. Uh, there's nothing. The whole thing was a blanket of snow in the whole area. So it would be six weeks when the snow had melted uh, by May. And I saw the wings sticking out of the trees. And I called my other friend who was up flying by. And he came over and we flew around and checked it and so on. So in time, I got, uh, he said, we'll go see the old man with General Chenault. We went and saw that. He gave me a photographer. We went and took pictures that we have here now. But I also have the pictures I took just before we hit, and uh, which I, I, I keep now. Now that was one of the hair raisers because I was lucky to have made it. I didn't follow him into the mountains.